Good afternoon. My name is Ben Weinert. I'm the Modest Report on the Stock Fellow. And it has been just a wonderfully stimulating day here at our conference on commercial republicanism. And uh, we now have our concluding event, uh, which will uh, feature a uh, reflection on the music of Haydn um, and commercial republicanism. Um, our speaker is Mary Sue Morrow, who is the musicologist at the University of Cincinnati. Um, she is an eminent scholar on 18th century music. Um, she's the author of German Music Criticism in the Late 18th Century, um, as well as uh, the author of uh, Concert Life in Haydn's Vienna, Aspects of a Developing Musical and Social Institution. She is accompanied um, this afternoon uh, by no fewer than nine musicians. We have um, uh, on string quartet, the Yas Quartet, newly formed uh, quartet in the last year um, that has just really taken off, uh, particularly here on the Roosevelt campus. But um, they will be, in just a couple of weeks' time, touring China, uh, representing this university um, abroad. We also have, yeah. We also have some wonderful vocalists, um, uh, Megan Beasley at the soprano, Jory Jennings on mezzo-soprano, Gregory Tufts on tenor and Peter Morgan on bass, um, as well as a, a pianist of somewhat more dubious reputation. Thank you, thank you, Dan. If I were to be suddenly able to do a bit of time travel and spend a few days with a musician from the past, I would definitely spend it with Joseph Haydn who has been my desert island composer all of my adult life. So when Ben Leinert contact, contacted me about giving a talk about music and commerce in the 18th century, it did not take me long to figure out how I was going to trim that enormous topic down to size. I will take any opportunity I have to talk about Haydn. But as it happens, not only was he the most famous composer in the second half of the 18th century, his career path illustrates quite clearly the changes in musical infrastructure and commerce that took place during his lifetime. Plus, he was also a very good businessman, though not always a completely honest one, as we will see later. We are also fortunate to have an unusually large amount of documentary information about him, in part because many of the records of the Esterhazy court, where he spent much of his life, have been preserved but also because three separate biographers, Georg August Griesinger, Albert Christoph Dies, and Giuseppe Carpani, visited him at the end of his life and published his memories of his childhood and youth. But before I delve into all of that, I need to fill you in on how you might have become a professional museum, museum, musician in the, in the 18th century and what your employment options might have been. If you were a child in Italy, you would probably have gotten your general and musical education at one of the four conservatories for, of music for boys in Naples, or at one of the four for girls in Venice. All were institutions for foundlings, though all accepted paying customers, and their purpose was to train the children for a useful occupation so they would not be a burden on society. If you look at example one in your handout, you will see a painting of the music room in the Ospedale della Pietà, where Vivaldi was music director in the early 18th century. Now the painting cannot be entirely accurate because all descriptions, written descriptions, say that the girls and women performed behind a sort of screen so that you could not see them clearly. This was, to my knowledge, the only place where women took play in public in an orchestra during the 18th century and probably well into the 19th century. Let me interrupt you for a moment. I'm so sorry. About the handouts, I, I should have handled this further earlier. The handouts, uh, if you, you have a limited number of them, but all of the slides are available on our website. Um, so if you have a tablet or a phone, just go to roosevelt.edu slash Montesquieu, which is also written on the back of the program, and you can follow along all I won't necessarily announce all of the slides, but maybe I'll give you a PowerPoint uh, warning, and so you can go to the next slide. 
There'll be a lot of them. There are twice as many slides as in the handout. Anyway, um, this was, to my knowledge, the only place women could play in public in an orchestra, and they were one of Venice's most popular tourist attractions. Their tie to commerce is that they brought the city a lot of money. A second path to becoming a professional musician was to be born into a family of professional musicians, like the Bach family in North Germany, or like the Mozarts in Salzburg. Or if you had some type of connection to one of the many small courts in Europe, the monarch might take a fancy to you, if you were a boy, and send you off to study music, usually in Italy, as was the case with Handel. Otherwise, your best chance was to be chosen as a choir boy at a cathedral, where you would get room and board, musical instruction, and a general education. This was Haydn's path. He was born in 1732 in the town of Rorau, example two, now in Hungary, into a family of wheelwrights. Thus, they belonged to the skilled artisan class, not to the peasantry, and Haydn's father served a term as magistrate of the village. Both his parents were musical. His father played the harp and his mother sang. And when Haydn was five or six, a distant cousin who was a school principal and music director in the town of nearby Heinberg, and this is going to be my signal for there's another PowerPoint, heard, heard him sing, saves, saves a lot of words, uh, heard him sing and was so impressed that he persuaded Haydn's parents to allow the child to come to live and study with him. But after only a year or so, the young boy was recruited in 1739 or 1740 by the Kapellmeister at the Stephansdom in Vienna, see example three, thus becoming a Vienna choir boy. Haydn remained at the Stephansdom for about 10 years until his voice broke when he was around 18 in late 1749 or early 1750. He left with a solid musical education. He played the violin, keyboard, and a number of other instruments, and had mastered the rudiments of composition. But he was entirely on his own. Musicians in Vienna had a number of employment possibilities. You could be chosen for the imperial court capella. Capella was a coverall term for the entire musical establishment, including singers and instrumentalists and copyists. You could either play or sing at one of Vienna's many churches or at one of the two court-sponsored theaters, the Burgtheater. Example four shows the exterior and example five shows the uh, interior. And the Theater am Kärtnertor, example six. Or you could give music lessons. Haydn did all of those things. In essence, he was a freelancer for the first decade of his career not unlike many budding musicians today. He seems to have been both smart and lucky and did have a number of benefactors along the way who loaned or even gave him money or offered him a place to live. Perhaps the best decision he made during those years was to rent a room in the Michaeler House, example seven, in the central part of Vienna. It's still there today next to the Michaeler Kirche. Viennese houses were socially stratified with the wealthy tenants living on the grand second and third floors and the starving artists up in the garret rooms. That's where Haydn lived. The wealthy tenants included the Martinez family who engaged Haydn to give keyboard and singing lessons to their daughter, Mariana. Mariana's education was being supervised by the court poet, Pietro Metastasio, the most important opera seria composer in the 18th century opera seria librettist in the 18th century, who also resided in the Michaeler house. Through Metastasio, Haydn met the Italian composer Nicola Porpora, with whom he studied and for whom he served as ballet and accompaniment for his singing lessons. Haydn later said that he learned the true principles of composition from Porpora, a fact that early German biographers tended to underplay because they really didn't want him to have any debt to the Italians, and they wanted him to be very, very German. But the most important part of this story is that the relationships that he established with Porpora, Metastasio, and the Martinez family gave him entree to the world of wealthy aristocratic patrons. In the meantime, however, he still had to make a living. I quote here from Griesinger's biography, quote, 
In this period, Haydn was also the leader of the orchestra in the convent at the Bar Pepsican Bruder at 60 gulden a year. Here he had to be in church at, in the church at 8 o'clock in the morning on Sundays and feast days. At 10 o'clock, he played the organ in what was then the chapel of Count Haugwitz, and at 11 o'clock, he sang at St. Stephen's. He was paid one gulden for each service. In the evenings, Haydn often went gasatem, which means serenading under someone's window, with his musical comrades. He recalled having composed a quintet for that purpose in 1753. Now, to give you a sense of how much money this was, 60 golden plus a doll, uh, golden for every time he sang at St. Stephen's, uh, a day laborer might have earned 60 golden in a year, working dawn to dusk six days a week. And this was essentially his church job. Haydn also sang for a few years in the court capella, led orchestras for carnival balls, and collaborated with a local comic actor, Josef Felix von Kurz, on two comedies with music, Der Krumme Teufel, or The Twisted Devil, which premiered in 1751 and was revived the following two seasons at the Theater am Kärntnertor. Their success inspired the pair to create Der Neue Krumme Teufel, the sequel, which was still being performed then. Yeah, in 1759, example eight shows the libretto that lists Haydn as the librettist, but unfortunately Haydn's music is lost. Thus, in the course of a decade, Haydn had exploited pretty much all the economic opportunities Vienna had to offer, save for a full-time full -time position with an aristocratic patron. But by the late 1750s, his various contacts began to pay off and he was hired by Baron Karl Joseph Thornberg to be the music master to his children. Thornberg was an amateur violinist, and during this time, Haydn wrote his first 10 string quartets for the Baron and his musical friends. The Baron then referred him to Count, so he's moving up the aristocratic scale. Uh, Count Karl Joseph Franz Mortin, who perhaps as early as 1757, hired Haydn as his music director at an annual salary of 200 gulden, as well as lodging and board at the officer's table. This was the type of position he had been working so hard for. And by the 26th of November in 1760, he felt financially secure enough to get married to Maria Anna Theresia Keller, who was actually the older sister of the woman that he had fallen in love with several years before. She, unfortunately for him, had entered a convent to fulfill the wishes of her devout parents. Haydn was able to bring 1,000 gulden to the marriage as a matching sum for Anna's dowry, so he'd clearly been earning and saving well. The wedding contract states that he was the music director for Count Morcine, but that did not last much longer because the count ran through all his money and was forced to disband the orchestra. Morcine, however, appears to have recommended him to Prince Paul Anton Esterhazy and Haydn and his wife moved to Eisenstadt in early 1761. His experience with Mortine illustrates the advantages and disadvantages of employment by aristocratic families. If they were prudent stewards of their fortune, it could be a lifetime gig with guaranteed room and board, a pension for old age, and even health care. If they were not wise stewards, you could suddenly find yourself suddenly unemployed with no safety net to break your fall. That didn't happen. And in fact, this move to Eisenstadt, the same residence of the uh, Esterhazy family, and this is in example nine, was quite a coup because the Esterhazys were the richest of the Hungarian nobility and in fact were wealthier than the imperial family in Vienna with an estimated annual income of around 700,000 gulden a comfortable educated class annual income would have been around 500 gulden. Prince Paul Anton already had a capella under the direction of Kapellmeister Gregor Werner, who at the time was in his early 70s and still composing in the style of his youth. Paul Anton preferred a more modern style, but it required some finessing on his part to update things without putting Werner's noise nose too far out of joint. He did so quite cleverly by dividing the duties of the Kapellmeister, assigning the higher status vocal music to Werner and leaving the lower status instrumental music to the new Vice Kapellmeister. 
All of this is spelled out in Haydn's contract, dated 1 May 1761. And there's several PowerPoints on the, on the web here. This contract was once thought to be demeaning, but in fact, it was pretty much standard language for the time. It says that Haydn had complete control of the instrumental music, that he was a house officer, thus not a livery servant, as he was sometimes described in the 19th century, but in the top ranks of the court administration, that he needed to be careful about forcing, enforcing the dress code for himself and his musicians, and that he should avoid fraternizing with said musicians because he was in effect their boss. He was required to compose pieces as requested, and everything he composed was the property of the prince. We'll come back to that a little later. He was to appear in the princely chambers both morning and afternoon every day of the week to inquire what music might be required. He had to settle all disputes among the musicians, ensure that the music and musical instruments were in good shape, instruct the female vocalists, and generally keep the musical establishment on a sound footing. For all of that, he received 400 gulden annually, plus board and room at the officer's table. We see in example 10, Haydn in a portrait painted around 1762 or 1763 with his wig and official uniform. When Werner died in 1766, Haydn became the Kapellmeister. By then, Paul Anton had died without issue, so the title had passed to his younger brother, Nicholas, in 1762. Nicholas, known as the Magnificent, turned out to be a passionate supporter of Haydn's music, Haydn and his music. He was an amateur musician who played a fairly obscure instrument, the baritone, example 11, that's spelled B-A-R-Y-T-O-N. Uh, it was a, it was bowed like a cello, but also had a set of sympathetic strings that could be plucked, and skilled players could bow a melody and pluck an accompaniment simultaneously. Haydn wrote 126 baritone trios for the prince, mostly for baritone, viola, and cello. He composed nearly all of these 126 baritone trios between 1766 and 1774, eight years, in his early years as Kapellmeister, the period in which he was composing and producing operas, writing around two dozen symphonies, two dozen keyboard sonatas, 18 string quartets, four masses, among other things. During these years, Prince Nicholas, when not playing the baritone, embarked on a multi-year building project that involved draining acres of Hungarian marshland to turn an old hunting lodge into a summer retreat where he could escape from the cares of the world. The result was Esterhaza, which you may see in example 12 and example 13. Hardly a rustic cottage, but an enormous palatial estate emulating the layout and splendor of the imperial summer palace of Schönbrunn, just outside Vienna. The central building was, completing between, was completed between 1762 and 1766. The opera house, the building on the left-hand side of the, of the print, uh, in example 13, opened in 1768 with Haydn's Lo Speziale, or the Apothecary. Here we see in example 14 what is presumed to be the interior of the opera theater, with the orchestra seated in rows while Haydn directs from the keyboard on the left. And in example 15, a program for Haydn's Il Mondo della Luna from 1777. Also constructed in 1768, was a building with a music room, so the orchestra could practice, and apartments for the musicians. Haydn had a suite of four rooms. H.C. Robbins Landon, Haydn's principal biographer, has estimated that the total cost of the project was an astronomical 13 million gulden, but he does not say how he arrived at that figure. Speaking of money, let's return to the much smaller sums that could be made by an enterprising musician. I have already discussed several ways that musicians could earn a living, giving lessons, working all or part-time in churches, uh, giving, uh, working all of the churches, theaters, or courts of all kind. But for composers, there were other ways as well. Getting commissions to write large works, organizing public concerts of your music, or publishing your music. But if we go back to clause four in example 16, of Haydn's 1761 contract, you can see that his music was not his to publish. Music 
publishing flourished in the late 18th century in large part because of innovations in printing techniques, such as those developed by J.G.I. Breitkopf in Leipzig. To publicize the works he had for sale, in 1762, Breitkopf started issuing periodic catalogs of music, uh, some published, some available in manuscript copies. In the 1763 update, example 17, we find the first sign of Haydn, a keyboard divertimento, what we would call a keyboard sonata. In 1765, example 18, we find eight string quartets, four from what we now call his Opus I, uh, four from, two from Opus II, plus two that were neither Haydn's nor originally string quartets. In 1764, uh, and this will be example 19, uh, we find the first known actual publication of his pieces by a Parisian publisher. Note the title, I'm translating into English here, Symphonies or Quartet Conversations, which indicates that the genre titles we know had not yet solidified. Haydn called most of his early quartets divertimentos. The publication included four works from the Opus 4, Opus 1 quartets, plus two flute quartets by Karl Jozotrowski. This opus had been put together by the publisher without Haydn's knowledge or permission, a common practice then in the days before copyright. By 1771, we see Breitkopf ordering the parts, offering the parts for his Opus 9 quartets, in 1772 for his Opus 17 quartets, published in Amsterdam, and then in 1775, his Opus 20, published in Offenbach. Unlike the 10 actual quartets in Opus 1 and 2, each of these three collections was planned as an opus, meaning that they contained six quartets in a variety of style and expression, uh, with each quartet in a different key and including at least one minor mode work. Opus 20 has actually two minor mode works. Given this, it seems pretty clear that Haydn wrote them for publication, so the prince must have given Haydn permission to do so. But if so, why was Haydn publishing them in Germany and not in Vienna or, or in, in Holland? The answer to that, was, is quest, that question is simply that Vienna was fairly slow on the uptake as far as music publishing goes, until the Italian family of Arteria opened a shop in 1778 and began trading in, publishing, and selling music as Arteria and Company. Part of the reason for this late start had to do with the fact that Vienna was awash in musical copy shops, the 18th century version of Kinko's. If you were in the market for a new symphony or two, you could peruse one of their catalogs, and they would copy out the performance parts for whichever pieces you requested. Notice that I said performance part, not a score. Both copy shops and composers, including Haydn, closely guarded their scores so that they could at least attempt to prevent unauthorized distribution. And if you are wondering how a conductor might conduct a symphony without a score, you needn't, because baton-waving interpretive conductors did not exist in the 18th century. The direction of the orchestra was shared between the concertmaster and the keyboard continual player who was playing from the bass part and realizing the harmonies at the keyboard. But I digress. Though we still do not know the details of how these quartets came to be published, we do know that Haydn and Prince Nicholas signed a new contract in January of 1779, one that allowed him to publish his music without needing permission. Thus, Haydn offered his next group of quartets, the Opus 33 quartets, to Arteria in 1781, and this time we have information on their pre-publication history. Haydn had decided that he would offer pre-publication manuscript copies at a, co a cost of six ducats, or about 25 gulden, to a dozen or so selected known music lovers, with the Swiss theologian J.C. Lavater among them. Haydn's letters to three of those potential patrons have survived and are dated December the 3rd, 1781. We do not know if any of his letters bore fruit, but he had clearly not been communicating with his intentions to his publisher, because at the end of January in 1782, two months after the letters were sent, Arteria placed an ad in the Wiener Zeitung saying that the edition of the quartets would be available in four weeks at the price of four gulden, 
won six of the price Haydn had asked for the manuscripts. Not only would the subscribers not have had much, if any, exclusive use of them, which was why they would have paid the 25 ducats. They had the new Haydn quartets and nobody else in the neighborhood did. Uh, it was even possible that not all would have even gotten the quartets. Haydn was furious and managed to get Arturia to delay the publication until April of 1782. But at this point, he was forced to admit that he had also sold the same quartets to a Berlin publisher who issued them in May of 1782. Such machinations and deceptions continued to characterize Haydn's dealing with music publisher, publishers who, to be fair, were not exactly a scrupulous lot themselves. But the publishers kept dealing with him because of the growing reputation as an original genius. Here is part of a review of the Opus 33 quartets that appeared in the Hamburgische Korrespondent in August of 1762. Haydn is an inexhaustible genius and seems to ex exceed himself with every new work that he produced. These quartets are above all praise. In them you will find magnificent melodies, exquisite harmony, unexpected and surprising modulations, and a host of new, never before heard ideas. But they require excellent performers, which we fortunately have for you here today. We will now be treated to a performance by Roosevelt University's own Yas Quartet of the final movement of Haydn's String Quartet, Opus 33, number two.
our guest, this last movement was of what is known, the last movement of what has become known, the Joke Quartet, a nickname that I cleverly chose not to mention. In modern times, the joke is always on the audience, and I thought maybe I, you might not bite, but you did, and I thank you for it, uh, which will invariably begin to applaud, and at least one of the silences are sometimes two or three. And the real trick, if you will look on your example 20, all right, I'll get example 20 out. Uh, but in the 18th century, the joke would have been as much on the performers as on the listeners, as ably enacted here by the quartet. Remember I said that works like symphonies and quartets were generally distributed in parts. And when you were sight reading through it for the first time, you would have probably only seen your part. So when the players encounter their first one measure rest in the score, if you read music, they might have assumed somebody else was playing at that point. Now what Haydn is doing here is separating out the measures of the initial rondo by one measure rest. And the, the uh, separating out, and it reaches its pro proper conclusion on the tonic key. This was originally power point, and I was going to point, but that was the really long rest because your ear heard. It was the end. You have three measures of rest, after which Haydn appears to begin again with the opening inconclusive motive. Are we done yet or not? So, why did Haydn choose to jumpstart his publishing career with this particular genre? One clue can be found in the review that I quoted, the comment about needing excellent performers. Until the very end of the 18th century, the string quartet, along with keyboard pieces and songs, were all aimed at the domestic market, at well-to-do, generally aristocratic musicians, amateur musicians, who would never violate societal norms by performing in public. That would look too much like work. But they could, com they could com com with complete propriety, play them in the privacy of their own homes for their own enjoyment and to entertain their friends and family. For example, in the early 19th century, uh, Herr von Wirt, a lightly ennobled banker, held private quartet mornings every Friday and Sunday during the winter season, with both noble amateurs and professionals participating. Interestingly enough, string quartets were never performed on public concerts in Vienna during this period through 1810, although they were in London. In fact, Haydn specifically co composed his Opus 71 and 74, each with three quartets, for his London concerts. In general, however, Haydn did not write large works like symphonies with the intention of publishing them because the market would have been too small to cover his cost. However, he was not averse to writing them on commission the second method of composers earning money that I mentioned above. A method that, of course, relied upon his reputation for excellence. You wouldn't commission a big work from someone you wouldn't know. And by the 1780s, the commissions began to roll in. A, Paris a, Parisian, aristocrat, the the Count a Parisian aristocrat, the Count Donny, commissioned six symphonies, that would be number 82 to 87, for performance at the Concert de la Loge Olympique, Haydn supposedly received 25 louis d'or for each of them, which was a lot of money. He then sold the publication rights to a French publishing firm for even more money. Haydn then sold 88 and 89 to a different Parisian publisher, and the same Count Dogny commissioned numbers 91 to 92, that's not what they were called at the time, that's how we know them, in the late 1780s. A serendipitous request for Haydn since he had just received a commission for three symphonies from the Bavarian prince Ertingen Wallerstein. So he decided to kill two commissions with one single set of quartets, probably figuring that the paths of the count and the baron were not likely to cross. <laughs> Haydn also received commissions for other large choral and instrumental works. He had contributed uh, an oratorio, Il Ritorno di Tobia, for the 1775 Linton fundraising concert given by the Tonkufu Society, a benevolent society founded to provide money for the widows and orphans of Viennese musicians. Il Ritorno was revised, revived, and produced and revised, and produced again in 1784, again by the Tonkufu Society. It actually became quite popular and was produced all over Europe from Rome to Lisbon, but we have no information on any kind of fans 
financial transactions that might have occurred. In 1786, he received an unusual commission from the canon of the cathedral in Cadiz, Spain, to compose a set of instrumental pieces on the theme of the seven last words of Christ. Haydn fulfilled the commission. Then he arranged and published the work for string quartets, since how many people are going to be going to Cadiz to hear that piece, as well as in a choral version. And of course, there were his final two oratorios, Die Schöpfung in 1799 and Die Jahreszeiten in 1801. The former in particular was performed all over the world and for years was the favorite fundraiser for Viennese charities. Haydn worked in collaboration with the Baron van Swieten, the court librarian, who in the early 1780s had founded a society, he called the Gesellschaft der Assoziierten, that sponsored private performances of oratorios. Mozart, in fact, had participated in some of these by updating some of Handel's oratorios. Haydn had brought back from England a manuscript of an oratorio libretto entitled The Creation, which apparently had been intended for Handel, but had never been set. Then Sweden translated the libretto into German. You will see this example 21. Here is the first page of Van Sweden's libretto translation with annotations on the left margin for Haydn. Uh, you, and then if you'll turn to example 22, here is Haydn's sketch for the introductory Sinfonia entitled Chaos or Chaos in C minor. The score was published by Breitkopf and Herfel in Leipzig, if you see example 23, in 1803, with 400 subscribers. Those of you, those of you who knew the work well will remember, know, those of you who know the work well will remember that when the archangel Raphael begins to tell the story of the creation from Genesis. He continues in the C minor of chaos. I've gotten behind on my PowerPoint indications. Until he and the chorus reach the words, and God said there must be light, and there was light, which arrives with the chorus and the orchestra pounding out a C major chord, double forte. Haydn kept this moment a complete secret and it electrified those first audiences as it can still do today. When early 19th century writers on musical aesthetics discussed the musical sublime, they gave this moment as an example of its perfect embodiment. But to move from the sublime back down to the mercenary, for Die Schöpfung, then Sweden's association paid Haydn 500 ducats, which was 2,250 gulden, to set the libretto and it also subsidized the copying of parts and performance expenses. The first private performance uh, in April of 19, 1798 was for Van Sweden's Gesellschaft der Assoziierten at the Schwarzenberg Palace. The first public performance was at the Burgtheater in March of 1799. Thus, the aristocratic patrons had exclusive use of it for a year. That was to become a custom in publishing that Beethoven followed. The first published edition, with 400 subscribers, appeared at the end of February in 1800. I think I've contradicted myself. The Yaris Seiden, based on James Thomas' famous poem, The Season, which again the Baron van Sweeten translated, never quite attained the popular or critical success of Die Schöpfung, though both, contained, both continued to be performed by the Tonkunze Society through the 1860s. In 1808, Haydn made his last public appearance at a performance of the Schöpfung given in honor of his 76th birthday in the hall of the old university. See example 24. <coughs> but I've jumped ahead a bit in my story and will now return to the end of September in 1790 when Prince Nicholas died at the age of 75. His son, Paul Anton, who did not share his father's passion for music, disbanded the orchestra and released Haydn from his duties, although he continued to pay him half his salary. Haydn and his wife then moved to Vienna. During the 1780s, the print, uh, Haydn had accompanied the prince to his palace in Vienna for the winter season. There he had made friends with many musicians, including Mozart, and had joined a Masonic lodge though he apparently rarely, if ever, attended meetings. But he had yet to tap into the third possibility for earning money that I mentioned earlier. 
giving public concerts. Once Paul Anton had relieved him of his duties, he was free to do so. He had been thinking about traveling to London, at that time the largest city in Europe. Its royal court and aristocratic families, of course, provided a good source of musical patronage. But in addition, London had a sizable, prosperous merchant class, which other European cities did not have to the same degree. So there was an even greater opportunity to make some money. Throughout the England, throughout the century, England had been an enthusiastic importer of <coughs> musical talent, particularly Italian singers and German instrumentalists in part because very few English men became professional musicians. It was not seen as a manly thing to do. And so the German entrepreneurs Johann Christian Bach, the youngest of the Bach boys, and Carl Friedrich Babel collaborated to produce an annual concert series in the fashionable West End section of London in the early 1760s. Concert series in London sprouted like weeds and Haydn's music had been popular since the 1780s. And so when Johann Peter Zahlemann, a German-born violinist and entrepreneur, invited him over for the 1791 season, Haydn could hardly say no, especially when Zahlemann guaranteed him in this season 300, 300 pounds for an opera, which was never produced because of theatrical polit politics, 300 pounds for six symphonies, 200 pounds for the right to publish those symphonies, 200 pounds for 20 other compositions to be conducted, and 200 pounds profit from a benefit concert that he ended up netting actually 350 pounds of his benefit. Thus, he had been guaranteed 1,200 pounds at a time when a comfortable upper middle class British family might have had an annual income of 500 pounds. And I do hope the internet gave me a more or less correct figure for that income. My, my Austrian figures I have from scholarship. Uh, guarantees in place, Haydn arrived at Dover on January the 1st, 1791. His arrival being reported in the Morning Chronicle on January 3. We know a lot about Haydn's two sojourns in London because the English press was very lively, with a dozen or so newspapers competing to report on the latest sensation. They announced Solomon's and Haydn's concerts and usually provided short reviews as well, something essentially unheard of in Vienna. The first concert took place on March 11 at the Hanover Square Rooms, see example 25, that's a print from the early 19th century which explains the costumes are not 18th century, which could accommodate an audience of 800 with the following program, see example 26. This type of programming, a mixture of vocal and instrumental works, with symphonies, or overtures, as the British like to call them, opening and sometimes closing each half of the concert. These were long evenings. And this was absolutely standard all over Europe in the 18th century. At least three papers offered reviews of that opening concert. <clears throat> I'll quote the first two uh, in more or less entirety and the third one abridged, abridged. The first concert under the auspice of Haydn was last night and never perhaps was there a richer musical treat. It is not astonishing that to souls capable of being touched by music, Haydn should be an object of homage and even of idolatry. For like our own Shakespeare, he moves and governs the passions at his will. His new grand overture was pronounced by every scientific ear to be a most wonderful composition, but the first movement in particular rises in grandeur of subject and the rich variety of air and passion beyond any even of his own productions. That was the Morning Chronicle. Second review. A musical treat under the immediate direction of the great Haydn promised connoisseurs an exquisite repast. There are a lot of um, food metaphors and music criticism in the 18th century. And they were not disappointed. A new grand overture by Haydn was received with the highest applause and deemed a composition as pleasing as scientific. The audience was so enraptured that by unanimous desire, the second movement was encored, and the third movement was vehemently demanded a second time also, but the modesty of the composer prevailed too strongly to admit a repetition. Yeah, right. Uh, <laughs> that was the diary. Uh, and finally from the London Chronicle, a new overture composed for the occasion by Haydn showed that the genius of this great master of harmony is yet in full vigor, end quote. 
Haydn had at his disposal the largest orchestra, which was 40 members, uh, that he had ever led. The orchestra uh, at Esterhaza in the 1780s topped out at about 24, and he clearly reveled in its sonic possibilities. Solomon put on a total of 12 concerts in the 1791 season, the last in early June, and he did the same in 1792 to continuing claim. A claim. Then Haydn returned to Vienna in late July of 1792, purchased a house in the suburb of Bumpendorf, that's example 27, the house is still there today, you can visit it as a museum, at the request of his wife, though they did not move in until five years later. As we all know, renovations can take some time. He had a bit of difficulty convincing Paul Anton to allow him to make a second trip to London, but he did manage to do so and left Vienna in January of 1794. His first concert, again with Hop Solomon in, Hy in Hanover Square, was on February the 10th, and again, 11 others followed. followed. However, by the beginning of 1795, Solomon relinquished the series, saying he was not able to get any good singers. So Haydn's 1795 concerts were under the direction of the virtuoso violinist Giovanni Battista Viotti and featured an even larger orchestra of 60. Haydn was having the time of his life. He was working with excellent musicians and playing to rapturous audiences, but he was also an indefatigable tourist. He visited museums and made notes. He went to visit the musician and astronomer William Herschel and looked through his telescope. He went to the races at Ascot Heath. He hobnobbed with the royal family and spent weekends at country houses of the aristocracy. He flirted with and composed keyboard sonatas for two of the women he met. But he also traveled to Oxford to receive an honorary doctor of music, that's the Oxford Symphony. And he set for portraits, see example 28. This one being the one he thought most looked like him. Though he considered remaining in England, in the end he decided to return to Vienna and take up his life again there. By the time Haydn returned, Paul Anton II had died and had been succeeded by his son, Nicholas II. The Esterhazys had lots of money, but very few names. Ha Haydn, it's true. Haydn's only task for him was to compose a mass for Nicholas's wife's name day. This Nicholas, a music lover, did reinstate the orchestra in 1799. But by then, the Esterhazys were one of only a handful of noble families who maintained a full orchestra. That part of the musical infrastructure, that route to employment, had more or less disappeared, replaced in Vienna and elsewhere in German-speaking lands by an increasingly active public concert life. Though we have no record that Haydn ever organized a concert in Vienna for his benefit before 1795. His music was certainly being performed. See example 20, 29 and 30. Here is a list of all the known Viennese public concerts, private, public and private concert programs between 1760 and 1810 that included at least one of his works. The earliest date was for the performance of Il Ritorno di Tobia that I have already mentioned but most are between 1790 and 1810. That does not mean that his works were not performed frequently before 1790. It simply means that the early theater records are very spotty. There is a lot that happened that we just don't know about, and the Viennese press was not lively. The only composer who ever came close to these numbers was, of course, Mozart, who was living in Vienna during the 1780s and giving and appearing on concerts right and left. The only record we have of Haydn organizing a concert of his works in Vienna was on the 18th of December in 1795 at the Theater am Kärntner Tor, the same place his early plays with music had been premiered. It featured three of the symphonies he wrote for London, along with some arias by two singers and a piano concerto composed and played by a young man who had moved to Vienna in November of 1792, Ludwig van Beethoven. In January of 1796, Haydn's name appears again, this is example 31, this time directing one of his new works on a concert given by Maria Bolla, and presumably that's why the announcement is in Italian, uh, again with Beethoven playing a concerto. 
Haydn does not appear to have organized another concert of his own music, though he did direct a number of public performances of vocal works. But by 1804, he had retired from his position with the Esterhazy family and from concert life and from composing. He died in 1809, leaving an estate valued at 55,000 gulden. We would all like, to, all us musicians would like to leave an estate with that value, right? Yeah. We would like to conclude by giving you a sample of Haydn's vocal music. At the same time that he was composing the two late oratorios and his last six, six masses, he had begun working on a series of part songs with keyboard accompaniment that he hoped to publish. He completed 13 of them between 1796 and 1799, and he told one of his biographers that they were composed con amore, in happy times and without commission, end quote. And they are very probably the only works of his for which the without commission is true. They are the distilled essence of Haydn. They are glorious and touching and witty and tender and solemn, and they are practically unknown. They were intended as social music for performance at home. They require only three or four singers and a keyboard player. But as such, they don't really fit into our conventional concert structure, perhaps one reason for their neglect. Thanks to the efforts of Ben Leinert and the group he assembled and has introduced, we can start to remedy the situation. Uh, with pleasure, I introduce again Megan Beasley, Jory Jennings, Gregory Tufts, Peter Morgan with Ben Leinert at the piano. They have three songs to perform for you today, and I have provided very loose uh, German text with a very loose translation in example 32. For the first, uh, ruminations on harmony in marriage. For the second, musings on the pleasures of the great. Thank you. 
calling card made up, you can see this in example 33, which quotes the first line of our final song, Der Greis, or The Old Man. What says, says on the card, gone is all of my strength, old and weak am I. Con amore, I will leave the last words to Haydn, Der Greis.
have some answers left. <laughs> yeah. I have three questions. I have four answers. Do you want it to be multiple choice? <laughs> the first question I hope will lead to a simple answer. What did Haydn have to do with Lessing? Did they meet? Did they know each other? Why does Haydn choose Lessing's remarks about eloquence to put to music? Because it made a good song. They never met. To I, not to my knowledge. I mean, he could have, could have, but, but I mean, he, he took poetry from all sorts of places, Gleim and 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 whatever whatever poet he thought would make a good song. The second question, I think, mm -hmm. also is quick an answer. Uh, on page fifty one of the PDF, there are verses on the arrival of Haydn in England. Yes, this I chose is, I chose to admit that from this. This is an astonishing document that compares Haydn to Newton upon Haydn's arrival in England mm -hmm. in the hope that science will continue to guide him. Can you talk a little bit about this? I can't talk more about that except to say, because I didn't read the whole thing, to be perfectly honest. I found it and I thought that's really cool that Bernie was writing something uh, about, about Haydn. And particularly because Bernie, Bern, Charles Bernie was a, tr was a travel writer and a historian. He was not a particularly fine poet, uh, but I, I'm afraid I can't. You probably know more about that than I do. Okay, so the third question. Okay. Uh, so from Haydn's birth, 1732, mm -hmm. to death in 1809, mm -hmm. given your lecture, it looks as if there was some fundamental transformation. Complete transformation. In the way in which composers earn their living. If you had to state in five and a half sentences, what? I can only do it in six. In Would that six, be okay? That's, that's six days of creation, it's four, perfect. Either. Not in four either. It's got to be five and a half. So what fundamentally was the way in which a composer would have been paid, say, in 1700, and then at the time of Haydn's death? What do these differences look like in principle? Okay, in the 17th, things are different in different parts of Europe. And so if we're talking about, uh, because in, in the 17th century, there was a lively publishing industry in Italy. And there were a lot of instrumental compositions published there. I mean, the Corelli sonatas in the early 18th century are what we know, but there were a lot of them. And interestingly enough, the instrumental works there were published in groups of 12. By the time you got to quartets in the mid-century, they were down to six. By the time you got to quartets at the very end of the 18th century, they were three in an opus. And finally, Beethoven started coming out one per opus. This is not what you ask. But I, trivia runs out of my mouth. Um, and so it had to do with the works getting longer. But at the beginning, if you were in the, in the beginning of the 18th century, your employment would have been at a court or a church. Or if you had been, it could have been one of the town waits the guys with the trombones that went around and told the hour and when danger was coming. Uh, in a few imperial uh, free cities in Europe, uh, in, uh, sorry, in Germany, like Leipzig and Hamburg, uh, there were opera houses, public opera houses, and places like that uh, where musicians could be employed. But at the beginning of the 18th century, and I've gone far beyond six sentences, um, it was courts or chapel. Uh, by the mid-century in Austria, it could be aristocratic families. Uh, the, aristoc the court had sort of gotten out of the business in Vienna, and so by the end of the century, since they no longer had the court to emulate, then the aristocratic families had dropped out of the business of doing orchestras. And so by that time, that option was all gone, but there were so many more concerts and so many more concert-giving organizations that that's where it all went. So that was the fundamental change. And the fundamental change in northern Germany and in Germany was the fact that it was easier to publish your music and there were more people publishing. One more question in addendum to that. Was there a corresponding change in the production of musical instruments? That is, as there was a change in the way in which composers were paid, 
Was there a corresponding change in the production of pianos and stringed instruments? Oh stuff? yeah, very, very definitely. Well, there, there weren't any pianos really widespread despite the fact it had been invented in 1720 until the 1770s or 1780s, it didn't become popular. Um, and there were definitely a lot more wind instruments being made. Uh, and Strat the Stradivarius family still making lots of violins, violins being made in northern Germany. The Steiner violins in northern Germany were very good. Uh, and so yes, there was the whole, the whole production of everything ramped up because of this great demand. And it was a demand not just in aristocratic quarters, but increasingly of larger public spaces, too. So that made, thank you very much. So, so fascinating. Um, something that just made me, a question just popped into my mind. How about popular music? Was there stuff going on on fairgrounds and places like that? Uh, there would have been, there were always street musicians and ta tavern fiddlers. Right. Uh, and uh, in Paris, there were uh, fair theaters where anybody could go, uh, and a lot of time aristocrats, and particularly aristocratic women, would go there masks so nobody they were there. And they would do body operas and comedy acts and things like that. And so that was in Paris. There was not much of that in Vienna, although there, were, there, there would have been tavern musicians. But, and there would have been probably the street musicians and tavern musicians were at the very bottom of the barrel. But yeah. Okay, I saw up there in the top and then up here. Uh, yeah, um, I was curious about the, uh, led us into some of Haydn's tricks and double publishing and that sort of thing, mm -hmm. or double, mm -hmm. double commissioning. Um, I wonder, A, if that was common. B, did, if it was common, did the, did the composers kind of have a pretty serious advantage over a more or less unregulated <laughs> wide open market on, on selling music all over Europe and, and calling it new every time? Um, well, to a certain- would that have changed? I, yes, I yeah, to a certain degree, yes, they did. Because you could, uh, you could, but if you didn't, then a publisher might sell the score to another publisher and you would get nothing. And so and sometimes double dealing was covering your back in some ways. Haydn did some other things that were less scrupulous. There was, he, he sent to a London publisher some sonatas that were apparently composed by one of his students. Playel, who later, that family founded the Playel piano, piano Factory, and Playel found out about it. And there was a small brouhaha and things like that. But the whole publishing market, there was a the beginning of copyright for music, and copyright in general in Britain during this time. But if, if, you ha if you had a score and you wanted to publish it, there was nothing that could be done. And a lot of Haydn's music that was published early, uh, some, some either the prince had been letting him out a lot earlier to get some published, or the, that someone had gotten hold of the parts and had published it uh, without his knowledge, like those quartets. Okay. The, um, the image of Haydn that we got here is sort of this, he's thoughtful, he's responding to the marketplace, he's seeing these changes and figuring out the different ways that he can plug into mm -hmm. it. And that seems different from the German music writers talking about the sublime or the English writers talking about the scientific. Is he paying attention to those types of comments and responding to those? Does he see himself as part of the sublime or does he see himself sort of in your response to Stuart's question of, this is a good text, this is gonna work. Is he making musical choices, business choices, philosophical choices, some of each? I think he was making the choices that he thought would be the best musically, possibly the most fun to compose, and the most effective. He did read criticism, because he responded to, in, in, a, in the Wiener Zeitung, the, pa the paper of Vienna, um, published a series of composer bios to say, yes, we Germans, they were generically German, right? Um, <laughs> uh, we Germans can write music too, and they talked about Haydn, and Haydn said that his music, this would have been in 1776, Haydn said his music had been received by everybody except those, except those critics in Berlin. And so he was aware, although I, I looked at all the criticism in Berlin during that period I could find, and I found no criticism of Haydn. Uh, 
my uh, advisor, Peter Brown, thought that he might have confused Berlin and Bern because, <laughs> you know, just a, just a little bit differently, a few different vowels. He might have confused Berlin and Bern because there was a, 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 dic, um, a sort of a dictionary of musicians that was published in Bern that did not have a very favorable review of Haydn. But generally speaking, all of the reviews of his instrumental music that I found, and I looked at a lot of them, were like the one I quoted. It was generally well received. I think there was a, yeah. I can probably hear you. Do you have any significance of there is that why the long and unhappy issue? Yes, the long and unhappy. I was I was hoping someone would ask that. I didn't want to put it in. Um, I'm sorry, uh, didn't mean that. Uh, the uh, um, the marriage was apparently not happy. Uh, Haydn said that uh, he was he did not avoid being attracted to other women because his wife could not have kids, which is a very strange way to put it. Uh, but apparently, both of them had affairs. Uh, she apparently had an affair with a painter, and he had a long-running affair with, of course, a soprano. Uh, and <laughs> yeah, she was, she was an opera singer at, at Esterhase, and one of the leading, and so apparently she did. Uh, apparently had an affair, and uh, she was married, uh, and the second son is suspected to have been Haydn's. He was always fond of him, but never acknowledged him. However, he signed with, uh, Luigi Pozzanelli was her name, and he signed a contract with her that saying if he were ever to become free to marry, otherwise, and his wife died in 1800, uh, if he ever were to marry again, he would only marry her. And so when his wife died, she got in touch with him. Uh, and by that time, it was in 1800, and by that time he was not in the mood to get married anymore, so uh, he did not marry her. But apparently the affairs were known in Esterhaza, and it was one of those things, this was the 18th century, you know, the dangerous liaison century. And so they were looked the other way. Otherwise, we know very little about Haydn's wife. Um, She's mentioned in Haydn, the Chronicle and Works on Haydn when she and, and her husband were godparents to one of the musician's children. And also uh, a couple of friends came to visit Haydn in Gunfendorf uh, at one point when she was still alive. And she was literate, but she was not educated and she spoke in a fairly coarse Viennese dialect. And if you have ever lived in Vienna, you know the dialect that, that I'm talking about. And a couple of uh, men came to find Haydn, and he had gone out. And she, they asked her, did, did Haydn not want to take her to, to England with him? Because she didn't go with him. She stayed behind. And she said, I didn't want to go. I don't want to leave Vienna. And so it may have been, uh, it's, it seems terrible that you would go away and leave your wife for th four years and then contemplate staying in England. But apparently it would have been OK with her, too, <laughs> as far as we can tell. I have a question, if I may. Um, in your understanding of uh, this history, was there any essential difference uh, between the various audiences that Haydn was writing for that would have affected his creative, his creative oh, process? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. If you were writing in the 18th century and you were a court musician, you knew the musicians you were writing for, you knew the taste of the prince. And you would have tailored your compositions partly to know what he wanted. Like I say, he went morning and afternoon, what music do you require? And so he would definitely have tailored the compositions to that and to the abilities of the performer. And all, all particularly opera composers in the 18th century, when they were writing an opera, and Mozart did this when he was young, he composed the recitatives when they were down in Italy uh, he composed the recitatives, but he waited until he got to the town where the opera was being performed and met the singers before he wrote the arias, because he tailored the arias to their voice. And so that kind of tailoring was not just Haydn, but all smart composers, because you want your, you want your um, aria to sound good, and you have a soprano who's got this lovely, gorgeous, deep tone in the right coloratura that goes up to high C. That's professional suicide for both of you. And so he, he tailored, he tailored things like that. That happened in Don Giovanni, which a tenor wrote. 
So as Haydn was transitioning from court <coughs> to public, um, is there an adjective that you can say Haydn's music became more? Haydn's music became more blank? He intentionally began in the things like the string quartets, and particularly with Opus 33, to make them in a more popular style so that they would be popular and people would play them. Now, the Opus 33 are glorious quartets, but it was a matter of not going down the deep counterpoint road, which he had kind of started down on Opus 20, uh, and moving to something a little lighter. When he got to London, he learned the taste of the English, and he had a bigger orchestra, and he could do more. Uh, and so his, the, the orchestration that he could do then, he'd never written for clarinets before because he didn't have any clarinetists. So uh, that changed according to the circumstance. So the, the long answer is yes. Today, this kind of, the, the scene around this kind of music, today the scene around this kind of music it feels hoity-toity and stodgy. But the uh, troubadours and actors and actresses I know for a long time have had the reputation of being lascivious and loose. What, as, as the crowd, uh, as this music became more in response to popular performances, what was the reputation of the music scene? The music scene, it depended on whether you were uh, a regular musician. Uh, there is one comment about Vivaldi earlier in the century that he plays fabulously, but like all members of the musical tribe, he really loves his wine. And so that was a comment. Um, if you were a female and an opera singer, you were assumed to be more or less a prostitute. Uh, yeah, yeah. If you were married, maybe not. But uh, maybe not. Or maybe not a prostitute. That's too coarse of a word. But you probably had a lover. And Caterina Cavalieri, who was one of the sopranos Mozart wrote for, uh, her lover was Lorenzo de Ponte, who was a priest. <coughs> and also the court poet and librettist. He later got kicked out of, of um, Vienna for writing scurrilous poetry and uh, having women. And then he went to England and they kicked him out the same thing. And then he moved to Sunbury, Pennsylvania and opened a vegetable stand. And I'm not making up any of that. <laughs> I can't think of a better way to end our conference <laughs> than upon that note. So okay. thank you very much, Rachel. Thank you.